Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India All right, uh, let's look at another example. Uh, this example is a little bit more realistic than uh, the stone wall that we saw, uh, you know, uh, previously, right? This example is about a groundwater levels data in a region. Now, groundwater levels data in a region, when, when we think about groundwater, the, the, the issue with groundwater is very similar to the coal, uh, you know, uh, seam beneath the surface. Well, what is common is that, you know, both groundwater and coal uh, are blind to the naked eye, right? So we can't really, we can, when we look down, you know, we know there is groundwater, but we can't really know what is the structure with, in which it exists and what's the flow, uh, direction, what are the, what are the different, uh, you know, uh, 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 dimensions of groundwater, uh, uh, you know, uh, in, in, in the way it exists uh, beneath the ground. So here is a schematic, you know, a picture, that has been sourced from the US Geological Survey, and it's a very old picture. You know, this picture sort of goes back to 1890, uh, 1896. Uh, but this picture is very informative. If you look at what's happening here, is that we have the ground surface, right? So ground surface by itself is quite irregular, right? And beneath the ground sur surface, of course, you have this, you have this uh, rock structure, right? I mean, rock or sand, uh, structure, right, the dotted area. And beneath the dotted area, the rock structure, we have what is called as the aquifer, right. Aquifer by itself is extremely irregular, right. Now, the aquifer, the way it exists is that it stores water at times as tubs which are large in size or as tubs which are small in size at different elevations, right? So if I were to start, you know, drawing water from this source D, and we, I, I start drawing water here, very soon this water will, will deplete and I'll, I'll start seeing the rock or the aquifer surface. And if I were to solely, you know, uh, uh, base my, uh, you know, uh, estimation of groundwater levels on location D, then perhaps what I'm going to say is that this, uh, this region does not have a lot of groundwater and most of, it, most of it has been depleted already. But if I were to go to locations E and F, I will have a very different conception of what's happening with groundwater levels in this region. So what, what this figure is showing us is that the aquifers exist as these tubs that contain water in different volumes and shapes, right? When it rains, when it will rain, let's say when the precipitation happens, you know, what's going to happen is maybe at the elevation, the water will start to slide down and probably from here, it'll start entering the, uh, you know, the aquifer region and sort of replenish the ground water, right? At times, you know, aquifers are also such that water exists, uh, you know, between hard rocks, right? I mean, so, so this tub here is, you know, a domain by itself. So if you were to draw water from here, you would have to really dig down deep, uh, you know, until here to be able to draw water from here. But location, this location A is very, very different from this location B, but probably A1 and B1. I shouldn't, I should be careful about notation here, right? Um, perhaps they are not stationary because the source of their repl replenishment for B1, which is going to come from here when it went through precipitation, for A1, it might be coming from somewhere else. Right. So, so we should be very, very careful before we go on to, you know, assign stationary uh, domains for groundwater levels. Right. So, so having sort of seen a picture, a very, very complex, uh, you know, perhaps a very complex picture of, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, the way or the structure in which groundwater exists, let's move forward and try and assess, uh, you know, 
the quest of for stationarity for this surface. So the, the, the exercise that we are doing here is to is that we are asking can we delineate the factors that impact spatial stationarity of groundwater data and we are, we are saying specifically for Uttar Pradesh, India. Okay, so I'm, I'm talking about this region in the pink boundary, uh, which is the state of UP in central India. And I'm trying to see if, if, if I can, you know, uh, 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 you know, delineate the factors that impact spatial stationarity of groundwater data. We have seen these data previously when we were doing, we did uh, an extensive exercise of exploratory data analysis with these data, right? So, um, so we have seen the data, we have seen the, some, some of the characteristics of these data, you know, what are the different levels and so on and so forth. Uh, you know, we know that the green, the green dots are, uh, you know, representing, uh, you know, uh, you know, not so deep water depths. Whereas, and the color goes from yellow to orange to red, we are looking at, you know, worsening groundwater level situations, right? Now the question is, where are the stationary domains in these data? Is the entire state a stationary domain in itself, right? Should I be sort of, you know, uh, you know, dividing the state, you know, in, in let's say four parts, four, four equal parts and keep, call each of these domains stationary? Should I divide them, you know, vertically or should I be dividing them horizontally, right? What should I do? Quite clearly, such a decision should not be arbitrary, right? Because once I define my stationary domain, only then can I say the average, you know, level of groundwater in that domain. Unless I have claimed or argued out that UP is spatially stationary, I cannot say what is the average level of groundwater. So the mean statistic is not defined unless I'm able to, you know, claim stationarity. Okay. Now, uh, okay. So, so, so clearly, you know, we need something more than arbitrary, you know, demarcation of stationary areas. And as we have seen earlier, perhaps we need expert domain knowledge. And one of the expert domain knowledges is the knowledge of aquifer types. So one of the things about the aquifer in UP is that it is an alluvial aquifer, right? What is an alluvial aquifer? Well, what it means is that there is very high lateral movement of water between these tubs. So these rocks are porous in nature. That is, water is all the time traveling uh, across these rocks. Right? If they were non-porous, if they were non-conductive, uh, then you know the, the kind the water capacity of you know what can be stored in these rocks will probably just depend on what's falling down from the surface and what's being extracted for irrigation or domestic purposes or industrial use. Right? But if they are porous, then the water levels are connected everywhere. Right? So the UP region in general is, is the alluvial aquifer and hence quite porous. That is not to say that, you know, that then we can just, you know, blindly, uh, uh, you know, that's a question. Can we now blindly assume that UP by itself is a spatially stationary domain as far as the groundwater data are concerned, right? Well, what we will see is probably not because there are other factors to worry about. Okay. So here is another sort of a, a data on aquifer, you know, thickness in meters across UP. So what we are seeing here is, you know, so the NCR region is, so, so, so the, uh, sorry. So this is New Delhi here. So what we see is that the region which is nearer to New Delhi, the aquifer is not so deep, right? Not so thick. So that capacity of storing water is not so high. But as we move, you know, eastward, there are very, very deep aquifers to be found. Of course, there are some, some patches of not so deep aquifers uh, in the east location as well. But, but largely, you know, moving eastward, I have, uh, you know, much more density of uh, deeper aquifers than I have on the, uh, on the area that is proximate to New Delhi. So there's a lot of media news of, you know, groundwater depletion around Delhi in the NCR region. Well, a lot of it could be urbanization demand, but also could be that there is less water retention capacity or water storage capacity of aquifers 
uh, near the Delhi uh, region. All right, so based on our discussions earlier, now let us try to identify factors that impact spatial stationarity of groundwater data, right. So now we discussed, I mean we looked at an aquifer structure, so aquifer, st aquifer structures can indeed be very irregular in space, right. Um, you, I mean what we have seen till now is that you know you could have uh, the aquifer containers could could have different types, for example, they could be alluvial in nature, they could also be uh, you know clay -y in nature. So, if it is clay you know it does not allow too much lateral movement of water, right. The other thing we saw was what is the thickness of the aquifer, that is to say what is the water you know retention capacity of an aquifer, right. So, these are spatial you know characteristics of what is going on you know beneath the surface when, when we try to understand the groundwater dynamics or how groundwater levels evolve uh, you know beneath the surface, right. So, so, so you know one factor that we are sure of that we will have to have an access to expert knowledge is on groundwater hydrology, right. Specifically what we have seen here is aquifer type. Right. So, we saw that you know this could be alluvial in nature, this could be uh, you know uh, 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 clay in nature, they could be hard rock, right, there is no movement whatsoever and so on and so forth. Second, we saw you know uh, a map on the thickness of aquifer which is nothing but the water storage storage capacity of an aquifer. There are more you know factors that groundwater hydrology will guide you to uh, you know regarding aquifer properties. Um, it is also important you know how fast the water moves from ground surface you know let us say if, if there is precipitation you know how much and how fast will it actually enter the aquifer uh, you know uh, uh, source of water, right. So, so, so clearly hydrology is important for making a decision on whether or not a region or a sub region a stationary domain of for groundwater uh, spatial analysis, right. What can be the other factors? Well, one of the things that came up in our discussions just uh, you know uh, 5 minutes ago was that there is there could be different. Uh, you know uh, uh, structures of demand for groundwater or consumption of, dem uh, of groundwater, right. Near the you know for the UP state near the New Delhi region, right. So, the so the areas like like Kautam uh, areas like Meerut uh, you know and so on and so forth. Uh, what you expect is a lot of groundwater demand is going to come from domestic use or industrial use, right. So, that demand is going to be very different from let us say if I go into the heartlands uh, you know towards central Uttar Pradesh or eastern Uttar Pradesh where majority of the demand is probably going to come from you know agricultural irrigation of groundwater using groundwater, right. Now, these two these uses that is domestic industrial are characteristically different from agricultural. Agricultural use is mostly for irrigation. It is also seasonal, it depends on crop cycles, you know when do you pl plant a crop, who does plant a crop and who does not, right. So, there is a lot of human decision making going on in terms of consumption of gr groundwater in different regions. So, the second very very important you know uh, 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 you know uh, 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 you know factors that will drive whether or not a domain is stationary for groundwater discharge is going to be uh, you know the human dimension or the human impacts, right. Uh, these can also be termed as the anthropogenic factors of groundwater you know uh, 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 dynamics, right. Well, you know you can have the exactly same hydrology beneath the ground, but if you put a farmer on the top or a uh, you know a, a leather factory or a sugar factory on the top you can expect very different you know groundwater uh, you know uh, levels uh, dynamics at those two locations. Uh, 
and we should not uh, you know treat them as as the same domain so we should not probably assign them the same average or uh, you know uh, 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 you know variance statistics or whatever right so we should probably have a different uh, you know uh, statistics a summary statistics for uh, for urban regions with a given aquifer type and a separate one for agricultural regions with a uh, you know maybe it's the same aquifer type right so these are now now we are looking at pairs of factors that we should be looking at when we are assigning stationary domains within the uttar pradesh region the third factor is obviously the rainfall right more generally we can say weather right for a, at a given time period if it's a it's a good rainfall year well you you can expect high uh, you know recharge if it's a bad rainfall year you know it's a drier patch uh, as far as the weather is concerned then you can expect the water levels to be slightly lower because the demand is sort of you know is ongoing uh, whether or not it rains uh, so much in fact if it doesn't rain so much you know for agriculture you know uh, uh, you know groundwater provides a substitute for you know for for cropping needs right so you may have even more vigorous discharge in lower uh, you know rainfall years so lower rainfall years will have sort of double whammy for uh, you know agricultural regions as far as the groundwater levels are concerned right so certainly you know different seasons so far as the rainfall levels are concerned uh, you know uh, monsoon non monsoon pre monsoon post monsoon perhaps they should be considered different stationary domains uh, you know, uh, 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 f uh, in order to sort of delineate, uh, you know, uh, summary statistics like mean, variance, standard deviation, the fifth, fifth percentile, the twenty-fifth percentile, the seventy-fifth percentile, and so on and so forth. Okay. So, what we learn through this exercise of looking at groundwater levels data is that spatial stationarity assessment depends on context. Right. The first thing we learned was that spatial stationarity assessment depends on scale okay and the second very important learning is that the spatial stationarity assessment depends on context if i were to lo look at you know a uh, 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 coal seam data oil exploration data groundwater data population data education data you know crime rates data spatially all of these different contexts will involve you know domain knowledge in order to make the decision of stationarity right and it will matter what will also matter is what scale are we making that decision at right what is or what is not a stationary domain depends critically on these factors okay so it's a complex decision we cannot avoid it we cannot run away from it in fact it's the first decision that we must make before we move on to uh, you know uh, uh, assigning summary statistics or conducting data analysis or so on and so forth okay okay so now i want to move on to the second uh, you know uh, 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 sort of uh, part of this this lecture which is where i will give you formal definitions of stationarity mathematical exposition of stationarity the first exposition that i want to talk about is called as the intrinsic stationarity right so i start with the spatial data model something that we have seen before what we are looking at is a random variable z at location s right so we have at every location s there is different levels of z that we can uh, you know expect to uh, realize and each realization potential realization of z at location s will happen with a given probability right uh, and s is in a given domain and domain is a d dimensional space so we will always sort of you know uh, you know simplify our life and let's say we work with a two dimensional domain okay so here i have data at different locations right and uh, you know and, and the data are at each location are given by random variable z s and you know small z at this location s can be thought of as a realization of this random variable 
right. Um, and we are you know s is simply the index also so every location is unique so I can just call it location 1, location 2, location 3, location 4 all the way to location n right okay. Then intrinsic stationarity is defined in terms of the first differences okay intrinsic stationarity by definition is defined on the first differences what is the first difference well z at location s and z at location s plus h right what is h h is the spatial lag okay h by itself is a vector that means it encompasses both you know distance and direction right if i have you know if i'm moving from s to s plus h i have the distance as well as the direction i can have a value of z s plus h prime where the distance as well as the direction will be different right the property on which you know intrinsic uh, you know stationarity is based is the first difference. First difference meaning z s minus z s plus h prime z s minus z s plus h. Now intrinsic stationarity is uh, holds when expectation z s plus h minus expectation z s is equal to 0. What does it mean? It means it means that expectation z s plus h is exactly equal to expectation z s. That means the mean value at each location is exactly the same. Remember we are pooling data in space to be able to comment upon summary statistics centrality measures at each location. So, the first assumption for intrinsic stationarity is that the mean value for z of s will be exactly the same no matter which location I am looking at right. So, you know whatever the shape of distribution the mean wherever the mean lies it will be exactly the same for all locations right. This is obviously the first moment pop property right. This is the first moment property for uh, you know uh, intrinsic stationarity. The second moment property, the second moment property is the variance obviously and the variance of the first difference that is z s plus h minus z s. Now on average that is in expectation, in expectation that is what we have said in expectation the value z s plus h and z s will be the same right. Of course for a given realization they can be different values. But in expectation if you were to if you were able to sort of sample at the same location 1000 times keeping everything else held constant right at the same location same world if you are sampling again and again on average each location will yield to the same value of groundwater level or the coal quality or the coal quantity whatever you are working with right whatever the context of your problem right. Now but the difference the variance in difference could be different right it is the second moment. Now the second moment property says the variance of z s plus h minus z s is equal to what we call as 2 gamma h. So where the expectation of first difference was independent of either the value z s or the lag vector h, the variance of this difference does not matter on the location but only the distance between the two. Uh, you know locations s1 and s2 right. So, it the, the, the second moment of the first difference between these values in space any two pairs any two pairs will solely depend on the lag between them with inside this function gamma h right. Now, this 2 gamma h is perhaps the most important parameter of spatial statistics okay it is called as the variogram. Okay, so, the variogram is of course coming from variance, it is a device by itself, it is an operator by itself right. So, the variogram basically is the variance of the first difference 
of locations uh, of pairs of locations across space if for a given domain of spatial data right now this variogram only depends on h it doesn't depend on z right it doesn't also depend on the location it depends on the distance uh, norm between two given vectors s1 and s2 right you can you can sort of call you know s plus h as s2 and s1 and and you know you can sort of think of any two locations in this domain so this is true for every s1 and s2 pair in domain d which is subset of the two dimensional real space okay um, all right so so we have learned the variogram we have looked at the the property of intrinsic stationarity okay let us move forward. So, I am going to just repeat this one more time. First of all, intrinsic stationarity is defined in terms of first differences. Second of all, it depends on the first moment and the second moment operators, uh, you know, expectation and variance. Okay. Variance of Zs plus h minus Zs yields is equal to 2 gamma h depends only on h, only on the lag vector depends only on spatial lag. If it depended on locations, that is to say that it also depended on let us say S, that is which location are you starting at, then it would not be intrinsic stationary. Okay? So, it can only depend on H. Okay? Um, now, stationarity or intrinsic stationarity again is a decision, it is not a hypothesis. I am I'm, I'm saying it again and again so that you know, you know, we, we do not fall in the trap of actually trying and testing uh, intrinsic stationarity. Okay. So, intrinsic stationarity is not the only type of stationarity, there are other forms of stationarity in data. The second one that we are looking at is called as the second order stationarity. What does the second order stationarity mean? Well, let us just draw our domain D again and think about data samples from the locations represented by these crosses in domain D. Right? Let us say we are looking at location S and location S plus H. Right? I can also call this S1 and I can also call this S2. Right? H by itself is a vector, it is the difference between S1 and S2. Remember, I am what I am writing is a L2 norm and we have seen at the earlier half of this course that, that this norm that is the distance between uh, you know locations S1 and S2 can be measured as Euclidean distance, at, as Manhattan distance, as great arc distance and so on and so forth. Okay. So, H again captures both distance and direction. Okay. Now, uh, you know the first condition for second order stationarity is that expectation Z of S is equal to a constant for all S in domain D. This is very similar to the first order condition. Uh, sorry, first order, first moment property of intrinsic stationarity. This is exactly the same, by the way. That would mean this would imply that expectation Z S plus H minus expect Z S, which will be nothing but expectation Z S plus H minus expectation Z S. Why can I take the expectation operator in? Because it is a linear operator, right? So it can simply enter in. Now, both S and S plus H lie in domain D, hence expectation values will be constant at both locations and what I get is just a 0. This is exactly the first uh, you know moment property of intrinsic stationarity. The second moment property of, intrins uh, of second order stationarity is, is, is different from intrinsic stationarity. It depends on the covariance operator uh, between locations Z S1 and S2. Remember, S1 is S and S2 is S1 or S plus H, okay? S plus H. Okay? 
Now, uh, you know, what is the difference between the variance of first difference and the covariance? Now, it turns out they are related. Now, if I were to sort of write down, I am going to try and write down the second order property, the second moment property, sorry, second moment property of uh, 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 intrinsic stationarity is variance of z s 1 minus z s 2 is equal to 2 gamma s 1 minus s 2 where you know previously we had just you know equated this to this value h right. Now, this would imply the LHS can be written as variance of z of s 1 plus the variance of z of s 2 minus 2 covariance of z of s 1 minus z of s 2. This is equal to nothing but 2 gamma h, where h is simply the distance between s 1 and s 2. Right? Now, this is interesting. Now, you have you, you basically see that the, the variogram, right, the variogram, this is my variogram and here the, the term covariance z s 1, oh sorry, it is not minus, it is uh, sorry about this fumble here, one second, um, okay, z of s 1 comma z of s 2, right, okay. Uh, now, this term here is my what is called as the covariogram, which you see right here as the second moment property of second order stationarity. Okay? Now, the covariogram and variogram are related and the way they are related is that now variance of z s 1 is nothing but you can write 2 gamma 0 because you have you know uh, uh, the distance between these two is 0 right not sorry not 2 gamma 2 twice of uh, sorry about that okay it is covariance with distance 0 this one variance of s2 is also covariance with distance 0 it's just covariance of sz at s2 with z at s2 right so we have c of 0 c of 0 sitting at uh, both terms here. So, now you can see that the variogram and the covariogram are linearly related. In fact, they are simply uh, you know uh, 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 inverse to each other. Okay? What this means is that if the covariance of you know values at two locations is high, the variogram value will be smaller. Uh, that is quite intuitive. Well, if the distance, if the difference between two values, well, expectation of the values is the same, but if the variation in the, dis the difference of values is high, then you would expect those values to be less related and hence the covariance will be smaller. If the variance of difference of two values at, different, at two locations is small, that means there will be much higher spatial dependence and hence you will have the covariance you know uh, 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 you know uh, to be uh, to be uh, to be high so if the variance of you know zs1 minus zs2 is small then spatial dependence is higher and hence the covariance of zs1 and zs2 is 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 also higher okay now this is this is this is interesting right i mean now so so you have this mirror image properties of second order properties uh, defined as intrinsic and, and and second order property of stationarity second order stationarity now these two definitions only differ by these two factors and these factors have uh, you know appear to be linearly related to each other just you know uh, linearly negative of each other but they are specifically different because covariance is a linear association property 
right? So covariances only sort of provide a measure of linear relationship between the value z at location 1 and location 2, okay? Variance on the other hand is highly nonlinear. So there are, there is a stricter assumptions required in order to sort of, you know, assert the covariogram, uh, you know, uh, the covariance stationarity or the second order stationarity in space. And therefore, intrinsic stationarity is considered to be a stronger property than the second order stationarity property, right? That is why the last sentence on this page says second order stationarity is also known as the weak stationarity or wide sense stationarity in a spatial domain, okay? All right. Let us move forward. La, there is a strict stationarity, strict spatial stationarity property as well or the strong spatial stationarity property as well. And this property relies on the joint distribution itself, right? Remember, we are, when we, when we are working with spatial data, we are working with these random functions, right? So you have data at location S1, you have data at location S2. S2 is nothing but S1 plus H, right, right? And what you are saying here is that, uh, you know, uh, 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 you have, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 the, the distribution of, you know, marginal distribution at each, at each location, the marginal distribution at each location, uh, they are, they are connected spatially. So, the data, all of these data in this domain are jointly distributed. If these joint distributions remain exactly the same, you know, even if we were to move the data by a lag, right, from some locations, we, you know, we, we sample S1 to SM and we, uh, we evaluate the empirical CDF. Then we move on to a different set of locations, again m data points, but with a lag, let us say we move 5 steps eastward, right, and we define an empirical CDF. If they are exactly the same, we say the data that is S1 to SM and S1 plus H to S1 plus SM plus H, which is 2m values, define a stationary, strict stationary or strong stationary domain, okay. Now, we we seldom use uh, such a strict stationarity property. Uh, usually, we are working with, uh, you know, we are we are we are working with uh, intrinsic uh, stationarity. So we'll see that most of our, you know, discussions going forward will rely on on this variogram device to uh, to 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 measure spatial dependence and to be able to, uh, you know, model it and then take it to regression analysis for further you know, uh, uh, resolving further issues. So remember, you know, in summary of this lecture, the validity of any summary statistic in space, that is the mean, variance, variogram, semi-variogram, covariogram, or whatever, depends on your decision of stationarity. We cannot avoid this decision. It is the heart of spatial statistics. I started this lecture with this comment that spatial stationarity is the heart of spatial statistics, and I am repeating it. Now, with a lot more knowledge at your, you know, uh, at your disposal. Now, decision of stationarity is, however, highly subjective and complicated, right? You need to argue it out in a rigorous manner. Expert domain knowledge and contextual knowledge is unavoidable when dealing with spatial data, right? Just like any other data sets, you know, here we have, uh, you know, we have to be uh, cognizant of expert domain knowledge, right? Probably more so in spatial data uh, because of the subjectivity involved. All right. So going forward, we will be now, you know, working on uh, measuring spatial dependence or spatial contiguity uh, from the next lecture. Uh, and, and, and I hope, uh, I hope uh, you had fun in this lecture. Thank you for your attention. See you next time. Mm -hmm.